Dr. Weinberg, it is an honor to be speaking with you. Can you explain some of the open questions in physics that need to be answered? Well, there are open questions. Uh, often when you read the history of science, you get the impression of a sequence of heroic moments in which everything moved toward a complete understanding. Uh, there was very often in the face of opposition uh, from leaders in philosophy or religion, there was uh, the realization after thousands of years of thinking that the uh, sun and the planets go around the earth, then in the 1600s through the work of uh, Galileo especially, it was understood that no, the uh, earth goes around the sun as do, and it's just another planet. Uh, in the 19th century, it became now, known mostly through the work of Charles Darwin uh, that plants and animals with all their wonderful capabilities are the way they are because of hundreds of millions of years of evolution acting on random mutations. And then uh, about the beginning of the 20th century, uh, after philosophers had speculated for more than 2,000 years that matter consists of tiny atoms too small to see, uh, and some scientists rejected that because they couldn't see them, it was learned that, uh, yes, that's right, atoms, atoms do make up all ordinary matter. So reading about these great advances, you might think, well, that's it. Um, we know everything now, and um, all that's needed is to apply this knowledge to uh, develop computers or vaccines or solar panels or whatever. And that's just not true. There are open questions in science uh, that are as challenging as anything we faced in the past. We know a lot. Sometimes people don't understand how much we know about the world, but we don't know everything. And uh, it's not clear when we will, and there's plenty left to do. Uh, the kind of open questions we have, I'd say fall into two categories. There are internal questions. There are areas where we think we understand all the fundamental principles, but the phenomena for some reason are too complicated for us to understand. Uh, one example um, it has to do with galaxies. I think many people are familiar with pictures of spiral galaxies, these beautiful things in the sky like a great spiral galaxy in the constellation Andromeda. They were originally discovered actually by a, um, an amateur astronomer in the 19th century. Uh, they, they look like the stars are on cords that are being spun around uh, like a pinwheel. But, you know, galaxies don't have cords. You just have stars and gas interacting through pressure and gravity. There's no cords to produce these spirals. So what produces the spiral arms in galaxies? Amazingly enough, although we understand gravity and the properties of gases that fill galaxies, we don't know. No one has been able to work out a satisfactory theory of the spiral arms of galaxies. There they are in the sky mocking us for our inability to do the calculation. Uh, there are other internal problems in science. Uh, for example, it was discovered in 1911 that some metal alloys lose all electrical resistance at a low enough temperature, a few degrees above absolute zero. This is a phenomenon called superconductivity because Electric currents just go on and on forever 
in rings of this material of these materials. That was pretty well understood in the 1950s, um, and we developed a theory of superconductivity, which worked, and it was based simply on the known properties of electric and magnetic fields and the atoms that make up these materials. And then in 1986, a new kind of superconductivity was discovered where the materials remain superconducting uh, above, not just a few degrees above absolute zero, but up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit above absolute zero. No one has a theory that works in describing these high temperature superconductors. Even though we think we understand everything that we need to know about electric and magnetic fields and about the atoms that these superconductors are made of. So these are internal problems within science, within physics that remain to be solved. Then there are external problems where we don't know the laws, where our ignorance is at a more fundamental level. It's not a question of calculating using known principles. It's a problem that we don't know the principles. For example, uh, well, we know about atoms. We know they consist of nuclei, little tiny uh, centers of mass and uh, electrons in orbit around the nuclei. We know that the particles inside the nuclei are composed of more fundamental particles called quarks. Those quarks, there are six kinds of quarks. They, they have, each has its own mass, its own weight. We, we have a theory of quarks that works very well, but we have to take those masses of the different quarks from experiment. We have no idea why they are what they are. Uh, some quarks are hundreds of times heavier than other quarks. Where do, where do those numbers come from? We have no idea. There are other mysterious things because there are particles that we know are not made of quarks that we have never seen in a laboratory, but astronomers tell us make up most of the matter in the universe, this is so-called dark matter. It's dark because it doesn't radiate, it doesn't interact with light. Uh, we just know about it because of its gravitational field. What is the dark matter? What kind of particles are those? They're not made of the familiar quarks that we know about in ordinary atoms. We have no idea. Well, I'm sorry, that's not right. We have a lot of ideas, all going in different directions. We don't know which is the right idea. That's the point. And it's, there are mysteries beyond dark matter. There's something called dark energy. This is an energy that is not in any kind of material particle, but is in space itself. It's so many calories of energy per quart of space. It is very, very tiny. Uh, in the whole volume of the Earth, it's less energy than you have in a tank of gasoline. But it's, there's a lot of space in the universe. And this energy contributes to the gravitational field of the universe in such a way that it's causing the expansion of the universe, the rushing a part of galaxies to speed up rather than has been, was thought earlier to slow down. Where does this dark energy come from? Why does it have the value it has? We don't know. So, uh, you know, Alexander the Great, uh, after he reached India, according to historians, cried because there were no more worlds for him to conquer. Uh, he was wrong. I mean, he hadn't gotten to China or Japan, much less to North or South America. There were lots of worlds he hadn't yet come to, much less conquered. So 
don't feel, and I hope no students of science today feel there are no worlds left for them to conquer. There are lots of mysteries that are waiting to be conquered. So today's students can inspire to win the Nobel Prize to solve some of these mysteries. Well, winning the Nobel Prize is not as great as solving the mysteries. <laughs> well, it's certainly a nice acknowledgement. <laughs> can, can you, can you uh, talk briefly about uh, teamwork and collaboration in science? We have thousands of physicists working at CERN. Can you just explain how teamwork and collaboration is, is, is a science practice that's critical? In physics, you're dealing with um, things that are way outside human life. Sometimes it feels a little chilly uh, to work on problems in physics because you're not dealing with human affairs. Uh, uh, I keep a television set on my desk to remind myself that there's human life out there besides uh, what I'm working on with equations. Uh, but one of the joys of scientific work uh, is collaborating with others, and it takes all forms. I'm a theorist. I don't work in the laboratory. Uh, they let me in, but I can't do anything useful in laboratories. I work with pencil and paper or computers. And uh, my work is, uh, most of it has been alone. Uh, some of it in small collaborations with two or three other people, one or two other people usually. Uh, but there's a great joy when the work, when we're working on these problems that they're shared problems that we Theorists, even though we're working separately and often alone, we can talk to each other about what we're doing. We understand what we're doing. We have a common language. Um, and uh, so uh, we meet in conferences and uh, there's a sense of excitement sometime when a scientific breakthrough is made. Now, experimentalists are in a different category, um, they have to work in large collaborations. That wasn't always true uh, when Ernest Rutherford in his laboratory at Manchester uh, discovered the nucleus of the atom. The experimental work was done by one postdoc named Geiger and a, an undergraduate. Uh, that kind of team hardly exists anymore in, at the frontier of physics. Uh, you have huge collaborations. Uh, I've seen physics articles where the title page that contain, contains all the names of the authors goes on not just one page, but several pages is longer than the rest of the article. Um, usually, um, people who uh, guide these groups rise in um, to the position of being spokespersons and um, their names became general become generally known. Uh, I have never worked in a collaboration like that, but I imagine that uh, being together with other scientists and often engineers who have to build these large accelerators and detectors, I imagine that it's satisfying to uh, use your skills for this common effort, uh, putting together uh, experiments that reveal something new about nature. But... Um, I haven't had that experience myself. There I am sitting at my desk alone with the television set on. And um, thank goodness there are experimentalists who are willing to provide the data that inspires and confirms our theories. Well, uh, one last uh, question. What is, what is it that you are 
most curious about? If you, if you could have one question answered, what, is, what would that question be? If you really limit me to one question, it would be, why is the world the way it is? <laughs> that would be an interesting answer, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much. This, this talk will be a, a tremendous inspiration to teachers and to students. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Okay, thank you.